Martha McChesney Berry was born on October 7, 1866, in Etowah County, Alabama, to Frances Margaret Berry and Thomas Berry. Her father achieved many things, such as becoming a lieutenant in the Mexican War, a 49er in the Gold Rush, and a captain for the Confederacy in the Civil War. Martha was the second of the oldest daughter out of seven children. When she was just an infant, her family moved to Rome, Georgia, where she would live for the rest of her life. Martha's father operated a plantation and was a partner in Berries & Company, a wholesale grocery and cotton brokerage business in Rome. In 1871, Martha's father bought Oak Hill, a residence located about two All aristocratic young ladies were sent to finishing school in those days, and it would be Martha's turn when she became 16. One morning at breakfast, a few weeks before her birthday, her father announced that Martha was going to Madame Lefebvre exclusive Edgeworth Finishing School in Baltimore. Even Captain Barry could not have known how wretched his daughter was with the whole idea as he put her on the train the autumn of 1883 bound for the terrifying unknown. Soon, she was riding back home to Oak Hill. Dear Papa, I have tried to like Madame Lefebvre's school, honest, but I don't belong here, and I never will. The girls make fun of my wardrobe and shun my company. It is all too, too humiliating, Papa. Please, may I come home? Yours devoted, Martha. Unfortunately, her father replied, saying, A baron never forsakes a goal until it's attained. Do not come home. You will be sent back to Baltimore on next train. Papa. Even though Martha grew up in a wealthy family, Martha's father never sheltered her from the tragedy of the Reconstruction years. Many times in her childhood, her father would take her on trips to visit the poor or sickly people in the mountains. On one important occasion, her father took her to help a friend who was injured in the war. Unfortunately, the man had died before they arrived and had left a family full of women who were unable to provide for themselves. Martha was surprised when her father offered work instead of charity. She asked him why he would do such a thing, and he responded, quote, It won't last long, my pet, not with six stomachs to fill. Besides, these people don't want charity. They want to help to help themselves. Don't ever forget that, Martha. They're not shiftless by any means. They want to work and work hard, but they don't know how to use their heads. Although she only received one year of formal education, she devoted her Sundays to reading and writing. One day, she met some mountain children walking down the road. She found out they were not familiar with the basic stories of the Bible, so she entertained them with some of her favorite stories. They asked to bring more friends the next week. Eventually, the numbers grew too big, and she had to relocate to a one-room chapel called Possum Trot. It was from this Sunday school that she earned the title, the Sunday Lady of Possum Trot. Martha was pleased with her work, but she felt as though the children needed a basic education. The neglect of the mountain children was absolute, and there were only five public schools in the state of Georgia at that time. It was impossible for children to attend regularly. Martha was going to do what no one else had done. Quote, Over the land my father left me, I'm going to build a school. She concluded that, in order to have sufficient impact on children, she needed to keep them at the schools, rather than to have them live at home. In 1902, she opened the Boys Industrial School. During the foundation process, she faced many hardships. She struggled finding money to fund it. She couldn't find a teacher who would work for little money, and her friends in affluent Georgian social circles disapproved of her involvement in the whole project. The students were unable to pay for the school, so she had them work it off. This was one of the lessons she learned from her father. Despite all of these impediments, Martha continued to strive for her goals. Sooner or later, expansion and money would become essential to meet community needs. Martha traveled at length to raise money. Some of the largest donors were Andrew Carnegie, Henry Ford, and Calvin Coolidge. President Roosevelt even held a dinner in the White House to raise money and encourage her to build a girls' school as well.
On Thanksgiving Day in 1909, the Berry Schools opened a co-educational program, open to girls and boys. The post-war decades swarmed with change. A high school career, which had been maximum preparation, was not adequate. So in Martha's mind, that meant to open a college. In 1930, Berry College opened its doors. Indeed, the work program at Berry College helped to keep operating costs low as students constructed the campus and maintained its facilities and allowed students to use their labor to pay all of their tuition and expenses. Throughout her life, Martha was committed to a number of causes and organizations and was presented with numerous awards and achievements. Martha passed away on February 27, 1942, at the St. Joseph Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. However, her legacy still lives on at Barry College. Today, Barry's voluntary work program has grown significantly, currently employing more than 1,600 students and making it the largest college in the work program of its kind in the nation. Some have said that Martha Barry was responsible for the creation of education programs grounded in Christian faith throughout the South. She was also accredited with the first woman to create a school for the poor who otherwise would not succeed. She defied the class system by giving opportunities for children who would otherwise not have them. As Martha would say, quote, Those that seek out the easy make themselves weaker. Those that seek out the difficult make themselves stronger.